Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I'm delighted to welcome everyone online to the first of our webinar series specifically focused on the higher education sector. I'm really pleased to be co-presenting today with my colleagues who are all uh, still in lockdown in Melbourne. Uh, so you'll see them from their home office or their lounge room. So my uh, colleague in the Workplace Relations, Employment and Safety team, Stuart Pill. Um, my colleague in the Forensic team, Deepak Pillay. And Andrew Morrison, who's the head of our commercial litigation uh, team at Clayton Newts nationally. So the presentation today is going to be broken up into three parts. Well, Stuart and I will talk about um, the legislative framework and specific issues facing the higher education sector in relation to um, alleged underpayments or what is being called in the media as, as wage theft. Deepak will then um, take you through what I think is a really interesting part of the presentation where he will show you what um, an underpayment audit looks like and how we use data analytics to um, assist you prepare a dashboard and consider whether or not there has been any underpayments or whether or not um, particular groups of employees are compliant. Andrew will then um, take everyone through a class action 101 presentation where um, he will explain what a class action is and how it may have an impact on the higher education sector. But I think as everyone who's online would be aware, um, allegations of wage theft uh, or underpayments of employees are very topical at the moment, not just within the higher education sector, but across government and the private sector in Australia. You'll see on your screen now a number of um, headlines that are repeatedly coming up in the media in relation to allegations of underpayment um, issues for employees. You'll see up there that a number of Australia's largest employers are affected by this. And since there's been a lot of commentary around um, why these issues have tended to arise, um, a lot of them are associated with um, grandfathered or lengthy confusing enterprise agreements that don't neatly match up with payroll systems and are largely, in my experience, um, inadvertent. One of the things that um, we will go through in today's presentation is you know, what we can do to assist you in terms of preventing any underpayment issues, but also in dealing with um, audits or rectifying issues that may arise. So if we just turn to the next slide, I'll just go through at a pretty high level what the legal framework is, because I think that for the most part this is pretty well understood. Particularly in the higher education sector, any underpayment issues will largely be as a result of a misapplication of an enterprise agreement. But in addition to that, there may be some employees covered by a modern award, although that's probably less likely. But the other areas in which you need to be familiar with are the National Employment Standards in the Fair Work Act and other legislation such as state-specific long service leave um, legislation. Now, payroll systems are all designed to cover off on all of those entitlements, but every now and again it can be as, as, as simple error in terms of the payroll system not lining up um, with the entitlements under an enterprise agreement that can cause um, an issue. And as everyone would be aware, the Fair Work Act does provide that um, it's an offence not to comply with obligations under the NES and um, not to comply with your obligations under an enterprise agreement. Some of the um, entitlements that we see uh, regularly or often misapplied uh, in relation to, say, for example, where there's a span of hours issue, where a payroll doesn't um, adequately or correctly identify what are ordinary hours as opposed to um, when overtime kicks in. Issues in relation to um, paid leave, the amount of redundancy pay or notice of termination. If there are any issues that um, arise, then you as a university could face proceedings or enforcement action. So proceedings could be brought by an employee or the union on behalf of employees or the Fair Work Ombudsman in relation to alleged breaches. One of the things that the Fair Work Ombudsman does do um, is seeks or negotiates enforceable undertakings with institutions in relation to um, alleged or 
um, remediated uh, underpayment claims, which often require um, ongoing auditing and reporting in relation to compliance with that enforceable undertaking. And as Andrew will um, discuss, there's also the potential for a class action in relation to um, a widespread underpayment issue. If we just move to the next slide, one of the areas that's evolved over the last few years in relation to underpayments claims um, is in relation to the requirement to keep records. Um, historically, one of the challenges for the Fair Work Ombudsman or for affected employees in proving an underpayment claim was that employers didn't have adequate records, so it was actually unable to be determined. So what's happened since 2017 is that there's effectively a reverse onus of proof in relation to um, the keeping of records. So if an employer hasn't kept records, which is an offence in itself, um, there is a presumption um, that the, well, the employer then has to disprove any allegations of underpayment. So that's a really important um, thing to consider. And when you're keeping records, you need to ensure that you're keeping them in relation to pay and hours of work, the leave, superannuation, any um, IFA that applies. Um, and one of the things that we see is that a pay slip doesn't always identify or doesn't contain enough information to identify how many hours an employee has actually worked. So it's difficult to actually assess whether or not there's been an underpayment. We can just move to the next slide um, and just uh, discuss the importance of compliance. In my experience, one of the key issues that an employer is concerned about when faced with an underpayment issue is the broad impact on its reputation and the impact it has on its relationship with its staff. In circumstances where an employer has a desire to be a good employer, to do the right thing, and it can be really disappointing for an employer if they find out that there has been some sort of inadvertent issue and to find yourself in the media and dealing with allegations of wage theft or um, somehow mistreating your employees. So I think that that's one of the key drivers um, in terms of um, complying with your legislative obligations. However, there's also the obvious um, compensation uh, bill and when you remediate an underpayment, um, it can be complex and it's something that can take a bit of time and you also end up with um, having to find ex-employees, calculate the value of their um, underpayment, then there's an interest component, then you have to work out um, whether there are any issues in relation to superannuation, both in terms of the statutory um, requirement and, and also any additional super that an employee is entitled to under an enterprise agreement. And so that process can be um, unwieldy and time consuming. The other thing is that you can face a penalty in relation to the breach. Individuals at a university could be potentially personally liable if they are knowingly or um, otherwise involved in their contravention and that's uh, pursuant to the Fair Work Act specifically. Um, in very, very limited circumstances, you could face a claim of a serious breach and that, you'll see at the bottom of your slide, carries a very significant penalty. To date, there's only been one successful prosecution in relation to that. Um, and it will only apply in very limited circumstances. And that's where a person has knowingly contravened the provision and that there's a, effectively a systemic pattern of conduct that relates to one or more persons affected. I think I'll, um, I'll hand over now to Stuart, who's going to take us through the specific issues facing the higher education sector. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> and can I also just indicate that if anyone has any questions along the way, um, there is a functionality on the system for you to um, send a question to us, um, and we will take some questions at the end. Um, just applying some of the points that Anna's made to the higher ed sector, why is this a key issue for higher education? And I think what we're seeing to some extent is a bit of a perfect storm. There are five or six things that are coming together, some that are 
um, applicable across the board and some that are applicable to higher education. Across the board, we have uh, coming off the back of things like the Banking Royal Commission, um, coming off the back of um, 7-Eleven uh, and similar sorts of blatant wage breaches, we have um, an increased focus on wage compliance and we've got a decreased tolerance for anything other than strict and full compliance. And the language of wage theft um, is uh, media friendly um, and attracts a significant profile. The second general thing which has occurred is we've had a series of high profile large employers. We've moved beyond 7-Eleven, we've moved beyond uh, restaurants in Canberra, we've moved to Woolworths, we've moved to the Commonwealth Bank um, and because of their size um, the headline numbers are much much larger. Um, so depending upon who you ask, we've got the Commonwealth Bank and we've got um, Coles uh, and Woolworths in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And that obviously attracts a lot of attention. If I go back only uh, five years, um, the biggest underpayment issue we had was $4 million. If I go back two years, the biggest underpayment issue we had was the Red Cross with $20 million. In addition to those general issues, there's a number of things happening with higher ed. And I think there's three things that are coming together um, only one of which is actually an underpayment in a strict sense, but the three things are the increased industrial issues around casualisation in the university sector and just the number and extent of casuals. Um, the second thing is that there are um, industrial claims for increased payments, um, increased payments for marking, increased payments for other aspects of academic sessional work. And the last thing that we're seeing is that uh, we have examples of um, identified underpayments in the higher education sector uh, reflected in um, some universities being reported in the public press as having reported to the Fair Work Ombudsman. It's really only that last issue, the failure to properly apply the EA provisions and sometimes legislation that is a true underpayment. What I was going to do for the next um, 15 minutes or so is just take you through the issues that have been reported or there's a general awareness of in the higher ed sector, why they're occurring, um, and then spend uh, some time talking about how to prevent that occurring and perhaps most importantly in the current environment, if there is an identified issue, to give you some general guidance about managing that issue and managing the risks associated with that issue. As Anna mentioned, underpayments can come in different guises and for different reasons. Sometimes they're uh, based on a, a failure to properly classify employees. Sometimes they're based upon an incorrect set of rules being put into the payroll system. Um, sometimes, a la tolls, they're based upon a belief that certain employees are either industrial instrument free or can be just paid by an annualised salary. What we're seeing more of being reported in the higher education sector is um, slightly different. Um, there are some elements of that floating around, but generally what we're seeing um, most commonly reported in the press is about academic sessionals. Um, and as a general issue across the board, an underpayment in relation to super attaching to annual leave loading. Some of the common issues being reported in relation to the academics are um, concern marking, uh, and they take different guises. Sometimes it's a, a failure to pay at all for marking. So there's a belief that the uh, marking does not require a separate additional payment to a tutorial or a lecture rate. Uh, and that may or may not be the case, depending upon the terms of the particular enterprise agreement. Uh, there are elements in marking of an insufficient allocation of time. And that's certainly been the focus of the reporting in the press. Um, with headlines of uh, academics being told to basically not mark sufficiently and to spend uh, an average of X minutes per student per exam. The second issue that we're seeing, and we've had this publicly reported for uh, one university, is characterisation of particular educational delivery activities. Uh, you'll 
generally be familiar that most universities, if not all, apply the same type of payment regime for academic sessionals with different sets of rates applying to lectures, tutorials and then other academic activities. We have examples of what are arguably tutorials or lectures being paid at different rates to those two things, being paid as other academic activities constituted by workshops, tracks, track classes, demonstrations. Uh, and depending upon whether that characterisation is correct, that may constitute um, a significant underpayment. We're seeing examples of meetings uh, not being paid for. And again, some uh, sometimes there's a grey question as to whether the meeting is already paid for with an incorporated rate. But we also have uh, reported examples of a view or a belief that the academic sessionals just were, weren't entitled to any payment for the required attendance at meetings. So that's a flavour of the sorts of issues that are being um, raised. It's certainly the flavour of the issues that were in the um, NTU submission that was made to the Senate inquiry in relation to underpayment and wage theft. As I mentioned, and I'm sure a number of people on the on the webinar are familiar, um, there is an Australia-wide issue about underpayment of super in relation to annual leave loading. Um, that's uh, been remediated at a number of universities and we had a legislative amnesty. Uh, that really does have a different character, it has a different cause and was not assisted by the ATO uh, changing its view about uh, that issue and not clearly communicating that as part of its published materials. So that gives you a sense of the sorts of um, perhaps most common underpayment issues that are um, being alleged or are being reported or arise. Um, to the extent that they're occurring, there's a number of uh, apparent contributing and overlapping factors, um, some of which are the sorts of things that Anna's already mentioned, but some which are unique, particularly to sessional academics that we see um, a lot generally is that is decentralised engagement, decentralised management of casual or sessional academic staff. And consequently, they're often uh, managed through different systems uh, and potentially have a, a different level of rigour in relation to the management of their employment to uh, non-sessional, non-academic staff. The second contributing cause is the nature of the work itself and the nature of academic employment. Uh, most of these issues would not exist if uh, academic staff were um, uh, monitored, uh, closely monitored, and um, had to be performing their work at a particular point in time, including their preparation work. That's anathema to academic employment. Um, academics have a high degree of autonomy, both in relation to uh, when they do their preparation work, how they do their preparation work, as well as the uh, content of their academic delivery. We do see a vast inconsistency of records and, and has made the point um, that since 2017, off the back of 711, there is that reverse onus provision. And so an absence of records or an absence of clear records will no longer assist. It will significantly hurt the management of any underpayment issue. We have seen a lot of large employers say it's all too complex, it's all too hard. And in one sense, the fact that there are so many large employers with payment issues um, does suggest that that is the case. Um, and I don't think that any university that we deal with um, has gone out of its way to do anything other than correctly pay its staff. Um, but there are some complexities both in the systems side of things, but also in relation to the particular nature of academic employment. There is a complexity to the way in which academic sessionals are paid. And lastly, um, I think it does have to be observed that um, whilst the university may uh, have a position and an intention, we do both in the higher education sector and outside the higher education sector sometimes see uh, local management uh, applying particular practices that are driven by budgetary considerations. And sometimes those uh, approaches do not align with the strict application of the enterprise agreement. 
So there, there, that's a bit of a, a grab bag of uh, the contributing causes. Um, uh, a lot of these issues aren't new, but they've certainly got an increased profile, and Anna's mentioned a lot about that already. In addition to the media, there is an ongoing Senate inquiry in relation to wage theft. Um, off the back of the uh, recent reporting, a number of universities were requested to make a submission to that inquiry, um, which has been done. And there was some reporting about that in the last week or so. Some of you will be familiar that the NCU have also gone out with um, a series of surveys, some of which are about true underpayment, but a lot of which is really about the broader industrial issue of casualisation of academic employment and whether the payment regime that applies to them is adequate, reasonable and sufficient. Lastly, off the back of both of or all three of those things, we've also seen some interest from uh, TEXA, um, so Tertiary Education Quality Standards Australia, um, who are, as I'm sure you're aware, responsible for the registration and accreditation of universities. Um, universities sign up to a set of framework threshold standards, um, arguably an underpayment issue and or a failure to under uh, sorry, report an underpayment issue to TEXA could be uh, inconsistent with those standards. So that's a that's a snapshot of what we're seeing in the higher education sector. I'll turn to preventing underpayments on the next slide. Um, some of these things will be obvious, um, but some of them I'll just reinforce. Um, sometimes the underpayment issue is because there's a genuine lack of clarity or ambiguity in an interpretation issue, and uh, that may end up as a dispute in the Fair Work Commission. It could end up as an underpayment issue. So having clarity as to your obligations, both under the EAs, under the NES, under the legislation. Making sure that that's understood at the local level, and I think that is probably one of the biggest um, breakdowns in universities, is that there is not on the ground, particularly at faculty level and particularly at individual uh, coordinating lecturer and the like, a fulsome understanding of some of the obligations and some of the nuances in the enterprise agreement. Um, universities obviously try and address that through a process of education and support. The systems issue, um, and we, we are aware that a lot of employers, large employers, outside the sector, inside the sector, are continuing to look at improvements in their systems um, to minimise the potential for uh, departures and non-compliances. Uh, there are a number of um, organisations that can assist in uh, auditing, uh, and there's obviously a number of um, systems that continue to be developed that weren't previously available. Keeping appropriate records, um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but uh, the default position has to be to keep accurate records of the employment and accurate records of the activities performed. If there is a decentralised engagement of casuals, um, that is a risk factor and it needs to be taken into account. And so there does need to be some additional steps and measures that are put in place, um, additional checks and balances. A process of periodic auditing, uh, I know universities are all audited. They all ultimately report to a state auditor general of some description, um, but this goes beyond that. This goes to specific auditing either of particular issues or of the payroll um, and associated systems generally. The no surprises rule, having in place um, grievance mechanisms, mechanisms by which employees can raise concerns um, in any large organisation with uh, thousands of employees, there will be examples of where employees are incorrectly paid. Um, and that is for a whole variety of reasons, some of which we've mentioned, um, some of which are um, employee driven, that they've entered their timesheet incorrectly. Uh, having a mechanism to deal with that, deal with it quickly, deal with it locally is definitely a, a part of preventing underpayments. The wish list item, um, simplify your industrial instruments. Um, and obviously with enterprise agreements that needs to be negotiated and ultimately approved. Um, but I think we will see across the board, including in higher ed, a desire to um, remove one of the contributing issues to non-compliance, which is it's too complex. It should be simpler. And if it's simpler, 
there'll be less non-compliance. Moving to managing underpayments. So notwithstanding uh, best intentions, notwithstanding great systems, notwithstanding um, uh, a high degree of compliance and education focus, there can still be underpayments. The key takeaway for you is that if there is an underpayment in your organisation, it's obviously going to need to be addressed. And it can be addressed well or it can be addressed badly. Um, the goal is to resolve the issue in a way that obviously ensures that you're fully compliant, but minimises the risk for the university. Um, so it does it in a way that minimises rather than exacerbates that risk. And that's reputational risk, uh, it's legal risk, it's individual personal legal risk. Um, and so that's one of the goals. The second goal, um, particularly in an organisation like a university, is to resolve the issue in a way that's consistent with the university's principles and that it's doing the right thing. Some of the key, um, and we, we don't have enough time today to go into all of the detail of this, but some of the, the overarching guidance for you is that where an issue comes to light, and it can come to light um, through a complaint to the Fair Work Ombudsman by an individual, it can be an inquiry by a staff member, it could be a broader issue raised by the union, the university may pick it up in an audit, the university may become aware of an issue in a number of different ways. Understanding quickly what the nature and extent of the issue is important. Um, it might be a one-off, it might be systemic. The critical point from our perspective is then before we run headlong into turning over every rock we can find, um, is to put in place a framework for managing the issue. Um, there will be a judgment that needs to be made about whether to make your inquiries and investigation um, under the scope of legal professional privilege. Um, or whether it's going to be uh, disclosed up front um, and um, uh, not the subject of privilege. Um, it's a critical question because in any litigation, in any investigation by a regulator, if documents have been produced that are not privileged, they will be required to be produced. Um, whereas with some very limited exceptions, if they are the subject of privilege, the university will have a choice about whether it's going to provide those documents. Communication, and I mentioned reputation, so whichever way um, the university approaches it, having a clear, strong, supporting communication strategy is important. I have to say we see a very common tension in our clients between the comms people and everybody else. Uh, the comms people are generally advocates for let's uh, go out uh, immediately, um, communicate broadly um, and put the emphasis on the communications um, without, in some instances, respectfully fully understanding the consequences of that approach. There needs to be the right strategy for the right organisation with the particular issue. The other issue that we do see, particularly in larger organisations, is a lack of discipline around the management of the issue and so ensuring that there is a clear internal governance and reporting process um, consistent with whatever approach the university is adopting. And so if it is under privilege um, that we don't have communications going to 10 different parts of the university, uh, we don't have 15 different committees um, all with different purposes considering the same material. The other issue that we do see is um, employers with an issue spend Sometimes um, the immediate focus working out who's been underpaid and by how much. In our view, that's the secondary focus. The primary focus is to get your house in order, ensure that you are currently compliant and that there isn't a continuing issue. Uh, and there's a number of ways in which that can be done. Some are systems based, some are administrative controls, some are educational. But having done all of that, um, then informed by whatever inquiries we've made, uh, a process for remediation. And that generally follows some form of investigation, review or audit. And the goal is um, generally with some sort of expert input and expert verification to have a valid, reasonable and defensible approach to identifying the underpayment. 
uh, and the circumstances in which it occurs. Remediation, there's some issues to consider. Um, how far back do you go? There's a statute of limitations for most of these causes of action of six years. Um, are you addressing both current and former staff? Usually the answer to that is yes, if it's um, a broader issue. Uh, interest, um, there are different ways to calculate interest, which DPAC will briefly touch on. And are there consequential underpayments, superannuation interest um, in relation to lost earnings in superannuation and the like? One of the other issues that needs to be considered both upfront and ongoing basis is your stakeholder engagement. Are you going to engage early with the regulators? Are you going to engage with the regulator at all? Um, are you going to engage with the union? Um, at what point will you communicate with staff? Uh, there's no one correct answer to those issues um, and it really is uh, horses for courses. Let's move briefly to the next slide and make a couple of concluding points about that. Um, there are pros and cons. There's no legal obligation to report an un underpayment to the Fair Work Ombudsman, um, nor is there an obligation to report that we think we've got an underpayment and we're doing an investigation and we'll let you know. This slide briefly captures some of the pros and cons, some of the benefits and some of the risks. Um, one of the critical issues will be, is there essentially a, a benefit in terms of the action that Fair Work Ombudsman may take from uh, self-reporting. I'd say on that issue, um, whilst it could assist in minimising the prospect of prosecution, we're not really seeing that play out in practice. Um, and we have seen a definite shift with the Fair Work Ombudsman that to some extent, whether you self-report or not, um, they're going to be expecting on any large underpayments enforceable action. Um, now that is potentially an enforceable undertaking, it's potentially a prosecution, um, but as I'll come to in a moment, the elements of an enforceable undertaking are increasingly onerous and increasingly extensive, and in some instances are actually much uh, broader in their reach than any court outcome would possibly be. So, so pros and cons, it's a, it's a um, question that needs to be carefully considered. Um, most organisations that have self-reported have done so once they've got clarity on their underpayment, clarity on the number and types of employees affected, and in many instances have already engaged in um, a remediation process. Um, others are self-reporting because they're reporting uh, to the market. So the, the Coles disclosure, the Woolworths disclosure, um, all of those disclosures occurred essentially concurrently with a disclosure to the ASX and a disclosure to the market, which was required by law. So I'll just close out on the next slide, um, the issue of self-reporting. The Ombudsman has an enforcement policy. Um, the enforcement policy is driven by two key issues. One is deterrence, so general and specific deterrence, and secondly, by um, the prospect of being successful in any proceedings against the employer. And you can see on the screen there um, that there is an emphasis on language that would reward self-reporting and cooperation. Um, but you'll also see that where there's more serious contraventions, large-scale underpayments, uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman may accept an enforceable undertaking, but essentially reserves its right to prosecute as well. Over to the next slide. Last slide from me. Um, we don't see um, amongst a number of employers a, a, a full understanding of what an enforceable undertaking requires. And uh, I've spoken to boards of organisations where there's a belief, well, we've got an underpayment issue, we'll just report and we'll just sign up to an enforceable undertaking and everything's fine. Um, the enforceable undertaking content has um, significantly increased as to what will be acceptable to the Fair Work Ombudsman. There needs to be an admission. You have to um, admit contraventions. There is almost always public apologies. Uh, if we think George Colombaris, uh, the nature and extent of his public apology was significant and rightly so, um, but that probably did more harm to his business than any uh, prosecution might ultimately have done. 
There's a contrition payment, didn't exist two years ago, but now it's almost mandatory, a contrition payment, 4.5% of the identified underpayment. Um, but I think the thing that most don't appreciate is that there is then almost always a legally enforceable and enforceable as a contravention of the Fair Work Act, ongoing um, audit regime and future self-reporting regime for the next typically three to five years. And so the enforceable undertaking will require the employer to do their own auditing, will generally require them to engage uh, a big four accounting firm to come in and do ongoing auditing of the payroll and to report each and every instance of underpayment or issues that are identified. It's obviously preferable to a high profile prosecution, um, but sometimes only just, uh, and um, those things need to be taken into account. I've mentioned the issues about the unions and, and obviously staff communication at what point is um, important. Clayton Newts can assist obviously in a number of ways um, in providing legal advice about your instruments, about reviewing and managing underpayments. Um, one of the other things that we can assist with is um, data analytics. And so data analytics has a role sometimes depending upon the nature of the potential underpayment. Um, sometimes data analytics is a tool that can significantly assist in confirming compliance or indeed identifying the extent of any non-compliance and who's been underpaid. I'll hand over to Deepak Pillai. Deepak is a member of our Forensic Technology Services team and a, a data guru, data analytics guru, um, and he can take you through some of the sorts of issues that come up in that space. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Um, I've just put up that little comic just to, to get started, but I'm sure a lot of you, when you have been speaking to data analytics professionals, uh, will probably hear a lot of jargon uh, that gets thrown up, uh, such as big data in the cloud, in memory computing. Uh, what I want to do in today's session is uh, demystify essentially what some of the activities that we undertake data analytics, and more specifically around helping identify the quantum of potential underpayments or, or if certain um, issues actually uh, exist. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, just before starting, what I wanted to cover was just to uh, talk about what is data analytics and what is the process that we go through when we are running data analytics. Um, firstly, I want to start off with what's the key component of data analytics, and that is data. Um, at the moment, all uh, every one of you, when you're interacting on the computer, uh, on your mobile phone, uh, on devices, um, you're actually generating data and information. That data is being captured electronically, um, so a lot of it being uh, collected into databases that are stored up uh, in your accounting systems, in your rostering, your timesheet systems, or up in the cloud as well. Uh, what data analytics is essentially trying to achieve, it is trying to analyze those large volumes of data to help identify certain patterns or run certain rules across that data to identify if certain issues actually. Um, I, I want to give you a bit of background as well as how data has also increased over the last, say, 15, 20 years. When I started off my career in data analytics, uh, a lot of companies were looking at collecting information. So they were looking at implementing systems where um, you're actually capturing the data. So timesheet systems, client management systems, uh, and all these systems to actually help collect the information. Um, they did use some reporting coming out of there, which was just simply summarizing that information. Um, as time has progressed, the volume of data has increased substantially. Um, you now are generating essentially the uh, same amount of data within a day that you would have been generating within a couple of years, a few years ago. Uh, and that volume of data is now too hard to essentially just report on uh, to find those trends. And the way we look at data now is that we want to use more advanced data analytics techniques to help identify some of those patterns, uh, to help identify particular issues. Um, so what is the process of data analytics? What do we actually do when we say somebody is uh, running some data analytics across a, a data set? Um, to simplify it, it's essentially three key steps. Uh, one is firstly collecting the data. So it's actually being able to source all of this electronic information uh, 
um, to be putting it into a central location that you can then actually analyze. Um, and this is actually a bit more difficult than it actually does sound. Uh, you might have information that is in your uh, timesheet system that could be easily extracted, but then you might also have other data such as uh, approvals for leave that might only be in emails. So going in and actually trying to identify when managers have actually approved leave could be quite difficult because you're trolling through thousands of emails and being able to find the relevant emails to actually show an approval. Um, so being able to actually get all of that information into the one place is, is quite a task in itself. Um, and also when it gets into some more advanced types of data, um, such as videos and audios, there's actually uh, even more complexity being able to try and identify the correct information that you extract from those data sources. Um, once we actually have the data in a central repository, um, that is when we are actually running our data analysis on um, that actual data. The techniques that are used vary, uh, so depending on the type of data that you're looking at, uh, you will be using different techniques, different technologies, different software, um, and there's just a, a large range to really get into uh, much detail. Uh, around. Um, but then lastly, once you have run through that analysis process, you are then presenting that information in a way that can be easily digested. Um, when I started off my career, a lot of it was done in spreadsheets. Uh, it was all these numbers in tabular formats. Uh, nowadays, it's about how do we present this information in a way that can be uh, easily understood, but can also be interacted with and deep dive to find out more information. So we tend to see a lot of this uh, data now being presented in a way such as dashboards that allow us to identify the, the uh, size of the problem very quickly, but then actually drill into and try and identify, okay, how does that then uh, affect a particular employee? Uh, and what is the breakdown of some of the issues related to that one particular employee? So that in general is the process that we actually undertake um, uh, in data analytics. Uh, now I'm going to essentially cover what are some of the issues that data analytics can, and can help in. Uh, if you can please move to the next slide. Um, so data analytics can be used in actually quite a, a few different types of issues. I put up a couple of examples here. Um, firstly, we can obviously help in looking at specific legal issues and helping quantify the, the potential size of that issue. Um, a, a good example of this is annualized uh, salary clauses. Um, it's actually uh, an issue that is also relevant to the, the legal industry. Um, as you would have probably seen, a lot of law firms have also been um, stung on this particular issue. Uh, and that is that um, obviously having an annualized salary clause, they're offsetting um, payments that an individual would get under a modern award um, has to be uh, enough to cover what they would have got if they were, were paid uh, on an hourly basis across that award. Um, so being able to actually test that, to collect all the information to say if the individual was paid uh, on a, uh, an hourly basis would uh, across a year, would that amount that they would have been paid under that award actually be uh, under what was actually paid as an annualized salary? Um, it sounds like a simple enough analytics task to do, but when you get into the detail, you tend to find that there's a lot of uh, difficulty sourcing the right information to be able to, to do that, um, that, that analytics work. And a good example of this is usually we see a lot of timesheet systems that are collecting information about how many hours are actually worked, but not necessarily the time of the day that the, uh, the work is actually completed. Um, and this could impact uh, certain types of rules in uh, modern awards and enterprise agreements where the time the individual finishes might impact um, how much that they get paid, whether it be standard time or time and a half. Uh, there are certain clauses that state if you don't have a certain amount of hours in between your last shift and your next shift, that the next shift um, might have to be charged at double time or time and a half. Uh, and if you relate this to flexible working arrangements, if, say, you have an individual that might log on late at night to um, look at some emails or quickly finalize a report uh, and then wake up early the next day to, uh, to start their day uh, and continue working, if the gap there isn't uh, a required size, that could mean all the hours in the day uh, are uh, classified as a higher rate. And therefore, to be able to do this testing becomes quite difficult if you don't know the actual time individuals are. Um, the other type of issue, obviously, employee payment validation. Um, so this is the, the big one where uh, a lot of organizations are looking to uh, 
uh, essentially test to make sure all the payments that they've done over a period of time have been complying with the, the relevant industrial instrument. Um, that is generally done through rerunning or recreating the rules a payroll system would actually undertake. Um, you would actually independently create the rules, so convert essentially that, uh, that industrial instrument into a set of rules. Then you would take the same data, so your timesheets or any other information, pass it through those independent set of rules to see if the amount that has been calculated actually lines up with what was actually paid to the employee. Um, this as well is uh, quite difficult. So you'll generally see a lot of issues um, in underpayments actually comes down to some of the complexity within those industrial instruments. Um, it becomes quite complex that when you start to implement them into a payroll system, the payroll system might not actually have the flexibility uh, to create some of these rules. So when you do independently check them, uh, you can realize that there are underpayments not due to intentional underpayment, but just due to the complexity and the configuration not aligning with the rules that are part of the, um, the industrial instrument. Um, another area where data analytics can help is um, specific risk modeling. Um, so this is looking at the likelihood of a particular issue occurring. Um, an example here is um, the Work Packless Rosado case where uh, an employee was uh, classified as a casual employee, but because of the way that they were working um, with rusted hours, consistent days of the week, consistent hours, um, that the employee should have actually been entitled to um, leave entitlements, uh, even though they were getting paid a casual loading rate to offset um, any of those entitlements. Um, so the ability to look at your uh, sessional uh, working um, staff and actually try and understand is there a likelihood that some of these individuals might be potentially classified um, as full-time staff because they are rostered to work the same days of the week, um, they're working the same hours, they're getting essentially uh, consistent pay. Therefore, is there a likelihood um, that they are entitled to uh, additional leave entitlements and should that be provisioned accordingly in your financial accounting? So looking at those specific types of um, uh, issues, you would have to risk model what is the likelihood uh, of a particular individual uh, being classified that way. Um, related to that as well is enterprise agreement modeling. Uh, a lot of times you'll find that in negotiations of enterprise agreements, um, there are ideas that are brought up, but then those ideas have to be taken uh, to the finance team to be able to model the uh, financial impact of any potential changes. Um, obviously with data analytics, you can build up specific models that allow you to have the ability to um, have all of those uh, new changes uh, actually modeled. And therefore, what you could potentially do in real time is say, if I take out this particular clause, but add this particular clause, what is the net financial impact? Uh, or if I add these five additional um, set of entitlements, but remove these other four, uh, what is the net impact? So being able to look at the uh, net impact of multiple changes in real time, uh, is quite powerful versus having to go and look at the impact of one change, come back, make another change, and have going through that reiteration process. Uh, another area is also the, the boot analysis. Um, so those that aren't familiar, the boot is looking at the better up overall test, where if you are making changes to um, an enterprise agreement, uh, you need to test to, to make sure employees will uh, be better off uh, based on those changes. Traditionally, how this is done is on scenario testing. So you look at sample scenarios or sample rosters uh, and test uh, the new rules to see how individuals uh, would be better or worse off uh, with the new rules being, uh, changes being implemented in the industrial. Um, this can actually be done uh, differently where if you say take all your employees' data for the uh, prior year and then apply the new set of um, changes to that historical data and see how the employees potentially could have been paid uh, over the previous year based on those changes, you can actually see uh, if they are better off or worse off. And this is a much more realistic um, analysis because you are taking hours actually worked over the previous years rather than some idealized scenarios. Uh, so it is a more comprehensive type of boot test. Um, and then lastly, ongoing audits. Um, this is very um, closely related to the employee payment validation. Obviously, if you are doing some testing historically to see if there have been any underpayments, those set of independent rules that have been created 
can actually be used as ongoing um, compliance testing. So say if you, every quarter you take the data, apply to the same set of independent rules to see if any issues have, um, have been present um, across that last quarter using those independent tests. Uh, if you can just move on to the next slide. Um, I just want to quickly cover what is the process that we actually go through uh, in undertaking the NLP, um, especially for underpayments. Um, generally, uh, here we work, so myself not being a lawyer, uh, more of a data analytics specialist, uh, I work very closely with our uh, legal uh, counterparts to try and understand what are the payroll rules that we need to create to be able to, uh, to test. Um, this legal interpretation is quite important. Um, because a lot of times um, in enterprise agreements, there could be um, certain interpretations uh, that might be that might want to be tested uh, to say if this interpretation was taken, what would the employee have been paid versus this interpretation of it. So understanding all the various legal interpretations and creating a set of rules is essentially the first step we would undertake uh, in running an underpayments audit. Um, and this is very important to be able to have both the legal teams and the data analytics teams be able to actually talk and communicate and speak the correct language. Um, because from a legal perspective, I don't understand um, the, the laws and some of the entitlements required, but being able to, to go to a lawyer who's worked with me in the past understands how the analytics actually runs. We can speak the same language and saying, oh, okay, if this is the type of test that we want to do, this is how we would actually undertake it. We would take this particular data, we would test to see if it is over this many hours, and then we would apply this logic to it. So that clear interpretation from the industrial instrument um, to a set of rules that a computer can understand is actually quite critical. Um, so the process we would do is work very closely with the, the lawyers to understand those set of rules uh, and then create the test that we want to apply. Um, these tests are essentially data analytics tests. Um, there's a set of rules which data is applied to and a result is actually provided from it. Um, defining these tests also helps us identify the sources of information that we need. Um, when we're doing testing for underpayments, it's not necessarily just payroll data that we need. There could actually be other sources of information that are required based on the uh, entitlements that are applicable. Um, we have had um, particular uh, entitlements that could relate to uh, the number of staff um, that a manager oversees. So if they're taking care of more than 10 staff, they might have additional entitlements. That information is not necessarily found in timesheets or actual payroll systems. Um, they might be in organizational structure data, which we then need to be able to, to take and apply to the models to test. Uh, a lot of organizations uh, have timesheet systems, but they might not necessarily main, uh, manage a, a roster system. They might be doing that on paper, um, or they might just be doing that uh, manually. Um, and we see a lot of enterprise agreements that might actually um, base certain entitlements based on when individuals are rostered or changes have happened to the roster, not necessarily the days that are actually worked. So being able to identify all this information is actually quite important. Um, and if that information isn't available, are there alternative proxy sets of data that we can use to, um, to potentially um, identify the same set of information? Um, and this might be, say, if you don't actually keep the time that individual start and the time that individual end, you might use, say, a swipe card access as your proxy. So being able to take the data from your swipe card system to see when an individual comes into the office um, or into a lecture hall and when they actually leave, you could use that information as a proxy for what time they started and what time they actually end. Um, data extraction is actually quite important as well, um, especially if the issue does become potentially contentious. Um, we want to make sure that information is collected in a way that it hasn't been manipulated. Uh, so being able to forensically uh, collect that information and make sure that um, there is traceability to show that this is what it was in the system uh, and there is no way that data could have been manipulated on, on the extraction uh, and therefore when it's used in the calculation it can be relied, relied upon. Uh, data cleansing, I won't worry with the details, but for, for me this is the most difficult part of the, the matter um, and that's because data is just in so many different formats, it can be interpreted very differently so to be able to take all of this data from various different systems, put it in a standardized format that can be used for testing, um, it is actually quite difficult and does take up the majority of the work actually required in running these analytics tests. Uh, lastly, the, uh, the data analytics tests themselves are quite 
uh, easy to do. Once you have the data in a nice format, the rules have been created, applying data to the rules is actually quite an easy process. Um, but this is also where you could identify additional um, trends, unusual trends, that you might want to further deep dive into, create certain rules, um, uh, or analyze further. So there is a bit of a, uh, a rabbit hole that you can fall into in this area. Um, as you identify more issues, you can look into it deeper and then just start going down this rabbit hole. Um, the last section I want to cover there is reporting and dashboarding. To me, this is probably the most important um, aspect of uh, carrying out underpayments analysis. You can carry out great analysis, but if that information can't be presented in a way that is succinct, easy to understand, um, and clearly identifies the areas of issue, um, all that hard work is is um, not going to be useful. Um, we can just move on to the, the next slide, um, which for me means visualization is actually quite an important part of uh, a lot of the data analytics work that I do. Um, Humans are visual creatures. At the end of the day, we are more likely to understand something, seeing it in a uh, in a manner that our eyes can easily look at. Based on colors, we can uh, differentiate groups. Uh, based on things like a scatter plot, we can see thing uh, see where things are relative, um, where changes uh, or impacts to one individual, uh, and how that is actually in relation to another individual. Um, a lot of that is uh, much easier to understand in a visual medium rather than a table. Uh, what I want to do right now is actually go and show you a bit of a demo uh, of what a dashboard looks like, so to show you how um, uh, how easy it is to actually try and understand uh, some of this information in a medium. One second, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, technology issues, working in technology is always great. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen here. So here's an example of how we would undertake an under analysis and how that information is presented. Uh, here you can see the, the main information that management will generally want to, what is the number of employees that might be impacted and what that quantum is. So the ability to actually see at the quick high level um, what the total quantum is, you can quickly see it here. If you did from a financial controller perspective need to understand how this impacts your finances, you can then look at it from a yearly level, how much uh, per quarter is actually impacted. Uh, you might then have middle management that wants to try and understand what the impact to individual employees, and that's where you've got information here in the scatter graph, where you can click on any individual employee and you can see what their potential underpayment is, um, and the individual reasons for that underpayment. So looking at the individual pay components, what their hourly pay rate according to the enterprise agreement is versus what they were paid, and potentially identifying any payment shortfalls. And payroll details to try and understand uh, which pay runs these underpayments occurred on. So we've got all of this information that can be looked at from both a high level perspective uh, and a granular level. You also have the ability to deep dive into particular periods so say if you had a large underpayment, say for one particular year, in this case 2016, you might want to try and understand what are the reasons for that. In this particular graph, you can see different colors. They actually represent different um, cost centers. So if there are particular cost centers that tend to be worse off, so here we can see the blues and the oranges tend to have larger underpayments versus the green, which the green tends to be um, not as much underpayment. So therefore, we can see that specific business units are actually worse off than others. And then the question comes down to, is there a reason because of the way that they're managed or, or for other particular reasons as well? Um, so that's just an example of how you can actually use visualization to be able to present that information quite easily. I might just go back to the slides. Um, the last aspect I wanted to talk about was how data analytics can also help with the remediation aspect. So what I've covered just previously there is how uh, data analytics is used to help identify the quantum or if there is a particular issue. Once we actually have identified the issue, um, there are certain aspects of remediation where data analytics can also be uh, useful. Um, the first one being interest calculations. So if an underpayment is identified, how do you then go about identifying um, interest on those underpayments? 
Um, there are different methods. Um, obviously, the most common is either simple interest or compounding interest. Um, they do make a big difference depending on the amount of time that underpayment um, is there for. Um, you could have larger percent on simple interest, um, uh, and therefore it's a fixed amount per year, versus if you're using compounding, what that means is um, if the uh, underpayment occurred back in 2010, uh, you would apply interest to 2010, um, you would sum up the underpayment plus the interest for 2010, and then 2011, you apply that same percentage, but with the, the higher amount. Over time, compounding interest can uh, become quite large, even if you are using a simpler um, a smaller percentage, um, the compounding amount will be a lot more significant the longer that underpayment issue is present for. So understanding the difference between uh, both of these, as well as the uh, communication um, that you're going to be uh, providing your employees, being able to, to state why you are using a certain uh, method of interest calculation and why you've justified a percentage, uh, you can use data analytics to help support that argument. Um, another aspect is also super, um, the super guarantee. Um, there is the ability here to potentially offset super, um, the super guarantee component if you are paying above uh, the SGC rate. So for a lot of universities that might be in the uni super deed where you are paying um, higher than the standard um, 9 point, current 9.5%, um, there is a potential there that if you have underpaid super historically, but uh, according to the, the super guarantee, but because you have paid a higher super rate um, as part of the uni super uh, deed, you can potentially use that additional payment to pre and offset, uh, pre and post offset any potential underpayments for the super guarantee. Um, using there are specific rules around that. You can only pre and post offset for a certain amount of time. So an amount can only be used for pre offset for a certain amount and for a post offset for a certain amount. So being able to optimize that model um, to try and get the most out of your pre and post offsets, um, that's where data analytics and a specific type of model can help um, uh, run that as well. Um, we've also had clients where they have wanted general support in other aspects, and so it might not necessarily be data analytics, but also generating employee notifications. Um, so we've had clients where uh, they wanted to customize specific emails with the details of underpayments for that individual. So being able to take all of that data uh, used in the calculations to generate emails as long with the supporting evidence uh, to then be able to generate an email that will go to individual employee, employees to, so they can understand their own individual underpayments calculations. Um, being able to create any supporting documentation, generally what we find is once um, an organization does tell their employees that there's a potential underpayment there, there's a lot of queries that are then coming into HR uh, and HR being able to have the supporting information per individual employee um, so that they can actually state this is what was paid over a period of time, this is what the initial calculation was, this is where we believe the potential issue was and what you should have been paid. So having that supporting information generated per employee uh, becomes quite useful when you are having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, there are other um, Aspects such as ATO notifications, um, if there is a super underpayment, you are required to essentially populate some standard reporting templates for the ATO so they can load that into their um, data systems to be able to track um, uh, any underpayments for a super over a period of time. So they have to be done in a very specific way, providing specific information such as um, TFNs um, and also uh, addresses and uh, details as well. Uh, and that has to be done per quarter. So the templates themselves state what is the uh, amount that was underpaid per quarter. Uh, so being able to generate all of that through all the data that's been collected on the underpayments is actually quite useful. Um, and then lastly, ongoing audits. Um, Stuart's mentioned this. Um, once you have built in all of this testing uh, for underpayments, uh, it is quite easy to actually implement it on an ongoing basis. You're essentially rerunning those same server rules with just updated data. So having that as part of your uh, comp uh, ongoing compliance um, uh, audits um, does become quite, oh, it becomes easier once you have actually gone through the process of um, creating all of these data analytics. Um, that's all I wanted to cover from a data analytics standpoint. Um, I will pass it now on to Andrew Morrison, uh, who will cover underpayments from a class action aspect. Thanks very much, Deepak. I think in the time I have, the, the, the difference between 
what you've heard from Deepak and then from Stuart and Anna is um, the difference between real current, quite frankly, driving uh, in terms of uh, assessment and, and input. And something that is a significant and, and media driven ghost story, which is more prospective at the moment, and that's the class section risk. But in, in mapping this out, what I'd wanted to do for listeners is to identify how the Australian class action framework provides a mechanism which really potentially could prove um, very enticing for the law firms or the, the union groups or the funders who um, can see uh, not just a value in terms of return for claimants, but also, and necessarily in the class action sector, value in terms of um, uh, return for investors and return for those who are bringing the claims as law firms. What do I mean? Some of you may be quite familiar with class actions, but uh, for those of you who have not, by way of a very simple introduction to the Australian model, there are three fundamental requirements. And it's all really ultimately about access to justice. First, seven or more claimants. Secondly, that the claim must really arise from um, same, similar or related circumstances. And thirdly, there must be one substantial, that is of substance, uh, common issue of law or fact. So seven or more claimants, uh, arising from same, similar or related circumstances, a common issue of uh, law or fact. If you put that into the current context, uh, the number of claimants is, is really in, in any of the well-reported, well-media-reported examples, not an issue, but there's a couple of things to add to it. It's only necessary for the firm commencing the action to have seven uh, clients. They don't have to be identified. The only person or, or the only person in this instance who, who would be identified is, say, the applicant, the lead applicant, or if there's more than one, and sometimes there is, the lead applicants. Therefore, it's in inchoate. You know who the lead applicant is. Um, you may know by definition who the seven are. But as to the claim and the constitution of the claim, it is definitional. It is not a named class action. That's a very important piece, and I'll explain why in the context of how class sections are then run. Does it arise from same, similar or related um, circumstances, or fundamentally in this sector, underpayment and everything that you've heard from, uh, from, from Anna and from Stuart, and in, in the really excellent presentation by Deepak, it's quite evident that it is coming up out of related circumstances. The difference might be uh, homogeneity versus subgroup analysis versus individual claims. But these are not disparate. These are truly connected um, issues. And wage underpayment is something um, that lends itself very firmly to the concept of related circumstances. And is there a substantial common issue of law or fact? Well, I think you can see from, um, from Stuart's slides, there's no doubt that there will be both federally and potentially at the state level uh, one subst substantial issue if there has been an underpayment, the, the legal entitlement to receive that for which you worked or to be properly assessed in terms of the labour that you provided, uh, particularly in the complexities of the tertiary sector in this country. You probably by now realise that the three issues, the three requirements for class action in this country aren't particularly onerous. Uh, what is also interesting and what is very important about class actions is that they uh, are generally um, uh, viable uh, because you define claimants definitionally. I mentioned that earlier. You describe them by characteristic, not by name. So all persons, in a generic sense, all persons who did not receive that payment from an employer to which they were entitled by reason of services render labour provided. And in that sense, while you name the applicant and you have to have seven clients, you don't actually have to go out, identify, retain, build, 
a book of claimants by uh, by identity. Uh, you simply have to commence the action in respect of that group. And why? Because in Australia we have an opt-out, not an opt-in class action system. If you meet the three requirements, if you bring the claim in respect of a justiciable issue, then in those circumstances uh, the law requires that group members, as defined, are given the opportunity to opt out of the class action. They don't have to opt in. So they don't have to um, sign an agreement with a law firm or sign an agreement with a funder. They, in fact, don't have to participate in a, in a, in a co-ex sense uh, until the common issues in the action have been determined. They may, in many instances, not be required to participate in the class action until very late in the piece, once the, the significant and common issues have been resolved in their favour, and then really only to prove for loss, that is to identify in a personal sense the amount of money to which they say that they are entitled, together with interest and costs, if that be the case. The most attractive element for uh, law firms and funders, and probably those trying to organise claims for the recoupment of underpayment, is the opt-out mechanism, because you can carry the group rather than carry clients, and you can do so in a way which means you stay in court, and, and obviously with that critical mass. You might ask, well, in that circumstance, how are the interests of each individual group member properly protected? Well, the answer in class actions in Australia is that it's a supervisory jurisdiction. The court exercises jurisdiction in respect of the interests of each and every group member and must determine the case in respect of each and every group member, even in an inchoate sense initially. And any settlement, and this is an important concern, any settlement must be judicially approved. So any settlement arrangement can't be done privately, can't be done on the back of an envelope, certainly can't be done out of public view. And there is, in fact, very, very strongly developed case law in this country as to the public way in which judges must decide whether a settlement is in the interests of each and every uh, group member. And that, of course, is designed to protect all of those group members, uh, all of those claimants who may be unrepresented. So that from that point of view, you have a model, you have a vehicle for the bringing of claims, which in the current context would seem highly attractive. And you may wonder why it's only recently that we're seeing uh, the NTEU or, or law firms talking more actively about commencement. And the reality is that if there is if there is a, an issue holding um, it back, it would be incentive, and it's fiscal incentive. Is there a sufficient fiscal incentive for law firms to attempt to bring claims like uh, claims of this kind without the support of a funder? Um, can they get the sort of recovery uh, that would make it viable to bring? Um, in Victoria, for example, in certain circumstances. We now have contingency fees where the law firm bringing the action can take a cut of the outcome. It's a heresy, at least in my view, it's a heresy. It's a heresy inherited from America, but it is meant to drive an access to justice and settlement system in this country. Query why law firms there haven't jumped on that particular bandwagon. The answer is because they're not. these actions are not for the faint-hearted. Well, why not a funded class action, going to the commercial market and finding a funder to bring the action? Well, funders generally want to know that they are home and host on liability. They generally want to have a good sense of the co group that they're acting for. And most importantly, what yield can they derive without, without, um, without it being not commercial for them to bring the action? And it would be fair to say that thus far, at least in the tertiary sector, Funders have not shown yet huge interest in the claims uh, for wage underpayment. Uh, and that may well be because not so much that the legal issues are not clearly capable of being determined in favour of those who've been underpaid, but whether the model offers them a, su a sufficient or significant return, one that they would ordinarily get in shareholder class actions or some of the larger product claims. And that's an area in which I've operated. So 
in some senses, class actions in this sector are at the moment a prospective ghost story. They would not be a desirable position to find yourself in as a university, partly because they're public, partly because they're, they're driven in a way that is all about return rather than rather than recoupment of monies lost, and partly because they would be on top of, not in place of, regulatory action of the kind that uh, that Stuart. Uh, and Anna were referring to. Um, and in, in that sense, they're a ghost story because um, from a reputational point of view in the current context of the Australian tertiary sector, uh, it, it, would, it would not aid uh, the, the management of uh, employee, sessional employee in particular, expectation. Uh, because of course, uh, the class actions in this country have some additional and quite concerning drivers particularly where group members may not have to lift a finger in terms of the loss they've had until very late in the piece. And if they don't have access to the data that Deepak referred to, then plainly uh, that will be something where uh, claimants need to do very little until all of the data has been appropriately assessed. There is one aspect of class actions that is potentially a positive. That may sound a little strange, in light of the comments I've just made. And that is because of the definitional nature, if you don't opt out of the class section, and realistically in Australia, when an opt out notice is issued and an opt out date is set, very few people do opt out. If you don't opt out, you will then generally be bound by the outcome of the common issue judgment, the first trial in that matter, if it goes to trial. Uh, and if you're bound by that, it will affect your, your entitlement. And if you're in that group and you're not entitled because actually the claim is faulty, you'll be bound by that outcome. So as a ring fencing technique, it may well be that a class action could be quite a potentially expensive but convenient vehicle for the resolution of claims. Uh, again, remember, judicially supervised settlements uh, are not necessarily something uh, that the university sector would want to engage in for the reasons I think I've already explained. A ring fence settlement, that is everyone who has not opted out is bound by the settlement, good, bad or indifferent, is another feature of class actions which um, in certain circumstances are proved to be an efficient tool for the final determination or resolution um, of the matter. But as you'll have gathered already, much of that efficacy requires a clear understanding of what the data discloses. And Deepak's presentation in particular is a really important piece because often in the work I do, that, that analysis is done because you've got the claim, not ahead of the claim. Um, the analysis Deepak has referred to is something that could be done in a privileged legal environment. It may be possible to set that work up so that there is advanced vision of what the loss claim might be, plus interest, plus costs. It might be capable of provisioning that loss or managing a settlement, um, but that requires some discretionary expender, expenditure ahead of time. It isn't just following the event. So the last thing I wanted to do in, in my comments was to, was to identify actually the, the data analytics aspect of being critically important to the work that uh, Anna and Stuart would do and that they would do with the data, but also from a class action, action risk point of view, critically important to assessing the risk that may exist in terms of a group claim, a group claim in respect of underpayment. And doing that within a privileged environment gives, gives universities the opportunity to strategically assess the course it takes, not reactively assess, um, assess what they're going to do. Uh, with that, I might hand back to our moderator, um, and otherwise happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, to appeal again, I'll just make a couple of concluding comments and then we, we do have a couple of questions. Um, we, we've mentioned, obviously, the work that we do in this space and um, it is an unfortunate reality for um, organisations, both in your sector and otherwise, that we are seeing more and more examples of these issues coming to light. Um, we'd be very happy to um, do a tailored briefing for particular individual universities
do some preliminary risk identification and ultimately um, if you need a full level of support we're obviously in a position to assist and support. We might um, just deal with a few questions. So we might take the, the presentation down and um, bring all of the presenters back. Uh, just a couple of questions. First one for you, Deepak, um, question about the use of underpayment big data and whether it can be used or combined with data of other conditions of employment, other characteristics of employees, presumably to enable some greater analysis, so characteristics such as gender, education level, um, and other elements of um, characteristics of employees. Uh, yeah, no, that data can be used for other specific modeling as well. Um, some examples that we actually uh, asked uh, is when it comes down to things like um, parental leave modeling. Um, so we're trying to identify potentially how uh, your employees might be taking parental leave coming up and how that could potentially impact from a financial perspective as well. And a lot of that information is the same type of data that you're taking in terms of the employee master details, um, based on essentially the employees, their, their gender, their, their age, um, to be able to then potentially identify over the next couple of years what the impact to uh, your parental leave policy might be if you're looking to make changes uh, to that as well. Um, we use it quite frequently for a lot of enterprise modeling uh, type activities. So uh, we do analysis in trying to identify certain groups, uh, what kind of leave that they take, um, to try and then identify the impact of any particular changes to entitlements uh, in your industrial instrument um, based on the, the, the bank up of your employee base. Thanks, Deepak. Um, question perhaps to you, Anna, um, reference to wage theft legislation. Um, we've obviously got, well, not obviously, we have wage theft legislation now here in Victoria, are we likely to see wage theft legislation elsewhere and what extra risks will that bring to the universities? Uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, yes, as you've mentioned, the, the bill has now been passed in Victoria in relation to wage theft um, legislation and a number of other states and the Commonwealth are looking at that legislation. It seems that the Commonwealth was looking into it and it got delayed as a result of um, COVID, but I think we can expect as um, the pressure sort of remains from uh, from unions and, and the media in relation to these issues that the Commonwealth will revisit. Um, there's also been some amendments in Queensland um, and WA has commenced an inquiry and there's also inquiries in South Australia and one potentially in Tasmania in relation to wage theft. I think that um, in terms of additional risks, it's really just the, the state-based um, way as opposed to just the federal um, jurisdiction in which um, well, wage theft or underpayments issues can be pursued. But I do think that it's likely to be um, on the serious end or the systemic or the more the serious breach type um, examples where it's likely to be an issue. But I think that it is an area that's going to continue to evolve. Thanks, Anna. And we've seen here in Victoria penalties of up to 10 years jail, as you say, for the more serious contraventions, so dishonestly withholding employee wages, falsifying records, um, and I think the grey one, failing to keep records to dishonestly obtain a financial advantage. Um, it'll obviously bring a, an increased profile to the extent we haven't already. Um, Andrew, the, as a, as a non-class action litigator, it sounds like there's a lot of significant um, exposure in theory to a, a raft of underpayment class actions. Um, is, is there, it might be an unfair question, but is there one particular thing apart from not underpaying that organisations can do to minimise the prospect of being the um, recipient of a class action? Um, you, you've taken away, um, obviously, <laughs> the most obvious, don't do it. Um, I think what is clear to me, and certainly my experience in class actions, is that it's the risk of viewing the group as being 
homogenous when in fact they are far from homogenous and that the claimants may well be uh, very nuanced in terms of subgroup analysis and and therefore the the work that universities do with their payroll groups and I, I want to stress again that the role that privilege could play here to understand not the prospect in a, a generic sense but the prospect in a more nuanced sense, sense. The scatter chart that Deepak put up is a very good example of how that attenuated risk management exercise could be undertaken. Um, if you have historically underpaid, you have, un you have done so. Um, if you want to understand um, where the bell curve sits across those underpayments, not just from the point of view of what might it cost you, but also in terms of um, if faced with a class action, what is your defence strategy? Or if you're going to resolve it, how do you move to that quickly with good information? And that last part is very important, Stuart, is that if you want to resolve it very quickly, you know you'll have to pay. You want to pay the, the, the amount that is appropriate. You will wear interest, which is running, the only way to do that is to be able to demonstrate that you've conducted effectively a data audit so that so that a court particularly a federal court can be satisfied subject to checks and balances that the that the resolution is a resolution that is in the interests of every group member not just the fortunate few thanks andrew I think unless there are any other last minute questions that anyone sends through, conscious of time, can we thank you for your attendance today? Um, this is the first of uh, a series of webinars that we're going to conduct specifically for higher education. Um, the invite identifies the um, next two with placeholders. Um, the next one relates to um, something that's much more dry from my perspective, but probably much more interesting to your financial teams um, and COOs, which is about unlocking the value in some of the campuses and campus assets, particularly in a post-COVID environment, and some of the financial structuring and real estate issues associated with that. So one for the lawyers, one for the um, finance team, uh, and um, further invitations will be sent out about those. So thanks again, and uh, for those who are in Melbourne, enjoy the sunshine, even if you can't go more than five kilometres. Uh, for those who are elsewhere, we're trying not to be jealous, but enjoy your weekend. Thanks very much.